Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the guest lecture series on SDGs Today, Tuesday, 26 October 2021. I am Tias from ITS Global Engagement, and we, I will be your Master of Ceremony this afternoon. Thank you for joining our guest lecture series today on SDGs. It is the ninth SDGs, namely industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Before we start our agenda, let me inform you some rules during the event. First, please adjust your name or ID screen using format name underscore campus. Okay. And second, during the lecture, please turn off your microphone and only turn on the microphone when the moderator gives the chance. And the third, please fill your attendance at dot lie slash gls underscore attendance. Our committee also send the attendance link in the Zoom chat room as well. And for participants who wish to get an uh, e-certificate and stamp, please fill the attendance 15 minutes after the session starts. And fourth, participants who wish to ask questions during the Q&A session, please send your question to bit.ly slash gls underscore QNA2. Okay. The link for questions also listed in the chat room. And you can ask directly by clicking the right hand feature. Okay. So today's so today's GLS on SDGs will present a topic entitled a simulation of train dynamics that will be delivered by Dr. King Wu from Central Queensland University. This lecture will be moderated by Bapa Ahmad Basofi Habib, PhD from ITS. Before we start our, our, our agenda, let me allow, allow me to deliver our schedule today as follows. So first, we will have opening at 3.30 and until 3.40. And second, there will be an introduction to moderator and speaker. And then we continue the lecture session, which will be held by 3.50 to 4.50. And then will be a Q&A session and that will be followed by certificate awarding. And last, we will come to a closing. Okay, before we proceed to the next agenda, let me introduce, let me introduce our moderator. Good afternoon, Bapak Ahmad Basofi. Yes, good afternoon, but yes. Okay. So our moderator today, Bapak Ahmad Basofi, PhD, was graduated from ITS majoring in civil servant then Bapak Ahmad Basofi acquired double degree, double degree Master of Science in Civil Engineering. And then in 2020, he obtained PhD in Seismic Isolation Engineering. And now, without further ado, let's proceed to the main agenda. Bapak Ahmad Basofi, the time is yours. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, Mbak Tias. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Bapak Ibu sekalian. And particularly, good afternoon, Dr. King Wu from Central Queensland University. So, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to, to present you our speaker today. We have Dr. King Wu from Central Queensland University. He graduated his PhD in Center for Railway Engineering from Central Queensland University, Australia, or CTU. And he graduated his master. Engineering in State K Laboratory of Traction Power, Southwest Jiangtong University, China. And also he graduated his bachelor in the Depart Department of Real Vehicle in the same university in China. And he is currently a research fellow in Center for Railway Engineering in Xiqiu, Australia. And he was a senior research officer in, in the same institution. And he was research assistant in State K Laboratory of Traction and Power in China. And his research area currently is rail transport engineering. So, and 
Road Transport Engineering. And today, this afternoon, Dr. King Wu will deliver us a lecture about the simulation on train dynamics. So I hope we hope that this, this topic will be very interesting for you, particularly for the student or researchers in the field of transportation engineering, civil engineering, and etc. So Dr. King, please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. King Wu, time is yours. Thank you. Yeah, good, good, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, or good morning, depends on where you are. Uh, Dr. Dr. Basofi, thanks for the introduction and uh, uh, thanks for the invitation from ITS. Uh, it is uh, absolutely a pleasure to uh, present some of our research at this uh, seminar. Um, we mainly do uh, railway research, but we also do some road uh, transport research. From your promotion video, I saw the IDS also do um, the automotive research. Uh, I guess from the multi-body dynamics point of view, you will find a lot of common, uh, common points between road and uh, uh, rail uh, systems. Um, yeah, so uh, should I start my presentation now? Okay, yes, please, Dr. Okay. Okay, I'll share. Yes. Yeah, I'll share my slides, but before I go to my uh, uh, research slides, I want to give you a brief introduction of who we are. We are, as introduced, a Sikhi university based in Australia. We have many campuses uh, around Australia. We also have a camp new campus in Indonesia. So if you're interested, just go Google Siki University, you will find other information. Here, uh, we are a, a railway research center. and uh, We do a wide range of research for railway systems, uh, including uh, train dynamics, uh, energy analysis, uh, well road contact, of course, uh, infrastructure uh, for civil, from civil engineering perspective, we also develop sensors, develop hardwares. We also develop our own softwares and everything. Um, we have, as shown in those three small pictures, we have a uh, heavy duty laboratory. We can do all sorts of uh, testing um, for different parts of those uh, railway vehicles and um, uh, uh, track components. And, Traditionally, we have been focusing on multi-body dynamics simulation, which is quite similar between road and railway vehicles. Um, like we, uh, recently, the energy issue is quite popular. I, I think uh, many of your colleagues also uh, had a look into that area. We also look at contact mechanics between um, uh, wheel and rail. Um, it's quite, um, you, you can find a lot of synergy between a wheel and rail contact mechanics and uh, tire and road contact mechanics. Um, and uh, we also do industry consulting. We do like, uh, we, we do testing for industry. We do simulation about train dynamics or energy and wear and uh, lubrications for the, for the industry. We do uh, sleepers for the uh, testing for the industry. This is just a, a, a some part of our research. Um, yeah, uh, if you if you are uh, interested for more information, please uh, contact us. We can have um, uh, further discussion about any collaborations or, or any studies uh, we want to do together. Um, now I want to go to my uh, research slides. Um, now, do you see the simulation of train dynamics slides now? Yes. Yeah. All right. See. Okay. Thanks for that. All right. Um, today I will be uh, talking about um, simulation of train dynamics. Um, this is a huge topic. Uh, my slides are quite brief. And um, because it has uh, a huge number of uh, subtopics to talk about, um, 
the purpose of today's uh, uh, presentation, you will be many uh, uh, for introduction or for indexes uh, uh, objective. So if you find any part of that uh, of this presentation is interesting, it is interesting. Obviously, uh, we have to deep deeper to and um, we have to talk further to 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 how to say to uh, further um, uh, uh, understand our research, doing research in those areas. Um, yeah, myself as introduced, I am a research fellow here. Um, yeah, previously worked in China as well, have been doing railway uh, research and study and uh, pretty much all my adult life. I'm quite uh, liking uh, this uh, research uh, 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 direction, research design. So uh, acknowledgement, uh, this presentation the world contains uh, CIE teamwork. It's not just my work. And it also contains many research projects funded by Australian Center for Rail Innovation and its industry partners. And um, I also used a couple of images uh, from internet and uh, from uh, open literature. And um, I'm currently 80% uh, of my time is uh, uh, funded by Australian Research Council. 20% is funded by Sikhi University. So I also have to acknowledge um, Australian Research Council. Thanks for their funding to allow me to do uh, better research. Um, now, this presentation, I will be talking about, I will start from 1D longitudinal train dynamics, which is um, the uh, uh, most profound um, train dynamics aspect. And then I will move to uh, two-dimensional, then now move to three-dimensional, and also explain, extend that to uh, train track dynamics. So um, um, at least here, uh, a, a number of references. Um, most of the contents in this presentation uh, come, come from our own work. And uh, if you're interested, you can go uh, have a look at those references. And also, uh, you can find us on Google Scanner and ResearchGate. Um, so, um, railway systems. Um, in Australia, we have a lot of heavy haul trains. And uh, um, uh, like we have 30,000 ton trains um, quite easily operating every day. Um, these, those are massive trains. We can also have like 20,000 ton coal trains and 10,000 times like a, uh, or six, six or 7,000 times intermodal container trains. Those trains are huge. Um, looking at this picture uh, the, of this train is a, a, a North American train uh, by the way, but, um, the, 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 the components and the, the system is quite similar. Looking at the picture, we have many things to simulate and we have many things to, to study. Like, um, all right, the, the track from from the bottom to the top, we will have the track system. The track system will have um, uh, the, the subgrade, um, the the ballast, the, the sleepers, then the rails. Then the rails and sleepers are connected by fast links, and then go up to the vehicle system. We will have uh, between the wheel and the rail. We will have uh, a wheel rail contact. Uh, sim the similar to road vehicles, you will have road tire contact. And uh, above that, uh, we will have um, suspensions, just like your uh, automotives. We will also have suspensions. We have tractions, just similar to automotives. We have brake systems, um, uh, different from um, different uh, from uh, automotives. We in railway trains. Um, we have a large number of uh, individual vehicles connected by uh, what we call copter system or inter-vehicle connections. Um, but for, uh, for um, road vehicles, they just run like individually. Uh, now uh, with platooning, um, you will find those 
uh, road vehicles operate just like railway trains because the platoon in pla um, automotive platoons, you have one car following another one. And in, in between, those connectors just become virtual. You will use software, you use wireless communication to connect individual vehicles. It's just that in railway trains, we have physical connections between individual vehicles. Um, yeah, I will be cover most of those components I just uh, talked about, and but uh, very briefly because uh, there are many details in them. Now, first, uh, uh, one the longitudinal train dynamics. So, uh, what is longitudinal train dynamics? So, uh, we in longitudinal train dynamics, uh, the research simplify each individual vehicle as one single degree of freedom reach the body. So there are two important concepts. First is it has only one degrees of freedom, one degree of freedom for each vehicle, and it only uh, consider rigid body. So which means the, 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 the simulated body doesn't um, deform, doesn't change shape. Um, of course, the single degrees of freedom is in the longitudinal direction. So by using that assumption, because that assumption came from many from the, uh, from the computing power uh, uh, limits uh, like years ago. So we, if we want to simulate the details of each individual vehicles, that will take a lot of uh, computing resources. So back in, back in like 1960, 1970, then uh, researchers come up with some simplification, simplifications that we only consider one degrees of freedom for each individual vehicle and then connected by nonlinear um, couplers. So by using that assumption now, what components we have to consider in 1D uh, non-cutinal train dynamics? First, we will have a track with um, up and down grades so that we will consider the gravitational components. Then with the, with the train moving on the track, we will consider rolling and curving resistance. Now, um, so um, as, as we mentioned, the individual vehicles are connected by couplers or inter-vehicle connections. So, in longitudinal train dynamics, one of the important um, uh, question we want we're asking is um, how big is the entering forces between individual vehicles? If the force are too large, it will break the couplers. Then your train will break, break in two, break in three. Then you will have a failure in your system. So in this case, we model the inter-vehicle connection to. Uh, a, a significant amount of details, which would include draft gear, which is the damper in that system, and uh, some other components like the, your followers, yoke, um, et cetera. Um, um, to move the train, of course, we will have traction system for the DB, DB means dynamic braking. Um, that thing, um, um, we, uh, there are also a couple of things we need to consider. We, we, we consider adhesion control, which means your traction force cannot exceed the maximum available friction between the wheel and the row. row. It's the same thing like you have ABS in automotives. And um, for the air brake system, for, for the brake system, we also have to consider uh, quite a few uh, details. Um, um, the brake system in, in train is uh, much more complicated than um, the automotive, um, only because uh, we in railway trains, the brake system, we have one long pipe stretch from the first locomotive to the end of the vehicle. And uh, in each individual vehicle, those uh, uh, brake valves um, are more uh, sophisticated. It serves more functions, like you have a uh, minimum service brake, which jet usually used to cor correct the speed of the train, or you have full service brake where 
where you want to use when you want to stop the train, or when you have emergencies, you want to have the emergency brake. So uh, those systems are a little bit more complicated than the brake system in road vehicles. Um, so like here in this uh, diagrams, we show uh, the components in the air brake systems we, we could consider in the, in the modeling. Like uh, we, we have compressors in the locomotive which provide compressed air to the main reservoir, then the main reservoir feed that air to each individual vehicle of the train. Uh, then on each individual wagon, we will have a quite sophisticated distributor valve, which is a, um, the center of the, the, the uh, wagon brake equipment. And then we have brake cylinders, we have brake riggings and the uh, brake shoes. Um, uh, different countries have different brake systems, like uh, they also work a little bit differently. Like in Australia, in China, um, uh, we use uh, accelerated release reservoir, which um, can make the, the because in railways, the, the train is very, very long. When you brake at the first vehicle, it may take 10 seconds for the last vehicle to start braking. So that is something different from road vehicles. In road vehicles, you brake at that instant, that, 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 that very instant, the vehicle just starts braking. But in railway trains, when you have a three kilometers long train, you brake the first one, it might take 10 seconds or even longer for the last vehicles that's to start breaking. So uh, uh, engineers have designed some components to accelerate this break and the um, release process, uh, like this accelerated release reservoir. And um, also like we have a uh, quick service and quick action function in the distributor valves. Um, um, anyway, this figure shows you there are quite a few co components you want to, uh, you can consider in those um, in those um, systems. Um, uh, to simulate this air brake system, there are also different methods. Like uh, the simplest would be the empirical method, where you just take the uh, experiment data, then uh, describe them like using lookup tables. Like you know, when we use MATLAB, we we often use a function called lookup table. Um, uh, or we just uh, uh, describe that um, brick cylinder pressure change as like exponential function or polynomial function. You can use the simpler function to describe how they are changing. Um, move to next level. If um, because the air brake system is basically a fluid or pneumatic system, um, um, to better describe the physical um, physical um, principle in the system, uh, we often have to use fluid dynamics uh, theories. Um, like in, in the brake pipe, it basically is a one dimensional um, fluid pipe. We often can use like a um, conservation of energy and conservation of uh, a uh, uh, momentum equation, partial differential equation to describe how this pressure and uh, uh, airflow uh, are changing in those brake pipes. Then come down to the brake valves. Um, we will have like a, a, the auxiliary, res auxiliary reservoir um, connected with the distributor valves or connected to accelerated valves uh, reservoir. So those reservoirs, when they are connected together, then you have to describe model the 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 um, the reservoir. One of the simple way is using the ideal gas uh, equation P V equals M R T. Then uh, in for those connections, you have to develop those orifice um, uh, or part, orifice uh, model to allow the air travel in between in those two um, reservoirs. Um, so yeah, um, simply um, if we want to say what components you need to develop a 
uh, fluid dynamics air brake model, you need a one dimensional fluid pipe model, which can be described by using um, conservation of energy, uh, conservation of mass, and conservation of momentum, um, um, partial differential equations. Then you will have volume simulation um, can be done by using ideal gas equation. Uh, uh, then for the orifice, you have to, there are different orifice uh, models available in open literature. Um, we, 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 we can um, search. Um, yeah, down to the, um, the mechanical system, like uh, the rigging and the wheel, brake shoe, um, uh, friction. Um, then the brake rigging is just a mecha me uh, mechanical transfer uh, system, which transfer the, the uh, force from the brake cylinder to the brake shows, which can be basically simulated by using a transfer factor. Like uh, oftentimes there is a transfer factor like say eight or six, uh, you, you just need to multiply by multiply the force you output, output you from the brake cylinder by eight or six, six, then that will be converted to the force on the wheel row, uh, a wheel um, and the ship brake show contact force. Then it, between the brake show and the brake uh, and the wheel, there is a brake coefficient. So that brake coefficient is often now near and change with the speed of the wheel and also oftentimes change with temperature. So when you have, say, in heavy trucks, um, when the truck is going a downgrade, a long steep downgrade, you will find that the, the sometimes the brake clamps gonna be overheated. It's the same thing for railway trains. And when the uh, brake shoes are overheated, the, the friction of coefficient of friction between the wheel and the uh, brake shoes gonna be de uh, decreased. Um, that, that factor uh, we sometimes also need to consider in the modeling. Anyway, that's some information about um, air brake systems. Um, for the traction and um, dynamic brake system, um, it's um, some sort of similar to the drive line in automotive, but all have some differences. Um, um, in um, in railway system, like we have different notches, like at different for the locomotive, have different notches. At different notches, you will have different uh, force velocity uh, curve, a uh, characteristic uh, curve. Um, it's similar to what you have in automotive, where you have uh, um, at different gears, you will have force and speed um, characteristics at different gear. That is the traction effort table and the performance table in this model. So to model this system, the first way input the notch, then we select a performance table from a database we stored in the model then that will come up a targeted traction force. Like uh, the same thing, that targeted traction force is basically the force ideally can be outputted, outputted from the, the traction motor. Like uh, in your engine, your, the force outputted from the engine is not necessarily uh, the same to the force in tire and road. Um, so that's why you will have couple more um, steps to get your final traction force. In this model, we included like a motor response control. Like um, uh, in mathematical model, we can jump from one notch to another notch in, the, in a very short time, like say 0.1 millisecond. And then the force can change by 30 or 40 kilonewton, which is um, three or four times. But in reality, you will have inertia 
which will have de some delay in those force transmit force changes. That's why we need a motor re response control. Then after that, we also have to consider the adhesion limit uh, between wheel and rail. Um, the same thing when road vehicles, we have to consider the adhesion limit between tire and road. So um, to get the maximum adhesion limit, we need um, many other inputs like uh, the adhesion limit is li uh, linked to the train speed, the, the, the vehicle speed. It's also linked to the road condition, to the rail condition. Um, it's also uh, linked like for um, the mass of the, the vehicle. So that's why we need this velocity, locomotive location and the mass information then to deliver the maximum uh, available adhesive force, adhesive force. Then after that, we can come up the traction force. <clears throat> there is a, a very special operation in railway system, which called sanding, which is the third or the fourth inputs from it. In, in this model. What is sanding? Sanding is like, okay, um, uh, in road vehicles, we have ABS system, which the vehicle detect if the tire is spinning. If the tire is spinning, then the traction control will decrease the traction force to make the, um, the tire and road adhesion back to its optimum uh, value. Um, but in railway system, um, that, that process works um, basically the same as road vehicle, but we have one extra operation is we have some sand carried in the locomotive. Then we can uh, release the sand, scatter the sand, drizzle the sand on a rail. So that will increase uh, the coefficient of friction between the wheel and the rail to prevent the wheel spinning or skidding. So that's, that is something different from uh, the train system and uh, the, uh, the automotive system. Uh, okay, so that is some information about the traction. For the dynamic braking is basically regenerate, re regenerative braking, uh, sorry, uh, re regenerative braking. You often use that in nowadays electrical vehicles. In electric or hybrid vehicles, when the when the when the when the road, when the, uh, when the car when when the car is braking, you can sort of uh, um, convert that brake force to generate some power, then feed back to your uh, battery of your uh, electrical vehicle. Um, the same theory for um, electric locomotives or uh, what we have nowadays, hybrid locomotive, um, which can get the energy back and then store in a battery or flywheel or, or, or fuel cell, then um, you can use that uh, in future. Um, but for the dynamic braking, uh, the modeling process is quite similar or what we can say is almost the same as the traction system. The traction, uh, system. Now for uh, inter-vehicle connections, there is a very, um, there is a very important components which is called draft gear. So you will have two, um, two road, railway vehicles connected by each other. If the connection is, rigid without any flexibility, you can easily break that uh, uh, connection. Considering the significant force in railway trains and the, 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 the very heavy mass of the railway trains, like in Australia, we have trains weigh uh, 35,000 tons, uh, some of them even 40,000 tons. That's very heavy train. Um, so in between, you will have some dampers. In these slides, I've shown you some dampers which they use in this interconnection system. Um, 
most commonly, um, uh, those dampers will have a friction clutch. Um, uh, those friction clutch can vary in designs as shown in this slide. Some of the friction clutch are more sophisticated as the shown in, uh, in the first one. Some of them are, ver are simpler. So the friction clutch, what they do is um, when the force, um, the, when they are moving, the friction force is going to absorb the energy uh, uh, in those systems. So to attenuate the vibration in um, in the system or to uh, decrease the impact force between different vehicles. Also, nowadays, they also insert um, polymers uh, um, or some hydraulic dampers in those uh, draft gear systems. Like um, uh, in the first uh, uh, design, those uh, uh, inner spring, out spring, they can be polymer springs. And all the springs in the second and third uh, designs, they can also be polymer springs or they can be uh, hydraulic springs. So they also help to improve uh, the per performance of the draft gear um, to better damping um, the, the, the forces. Um, for the resistance force and the gradient force, um, they are. Uh, uh, much more simplified. Uh, all from my point of view, um, they are too complicated and we don't know how to model them exactly. So we use empirical uh, formulas. Um, I recently published two papers on um, curving resistance. Like um, that curving resistance formula is quite simple, but in reality, the, the reality is much, much more complicated than that simple formula. But uh, because it's too complicated and uh, we currently don't have any good simulation approaches to, to model them. So we have been using this empirical formula developed by researchers in 1930, 1940, 1950, uh, ages ago. So if you, any of you are interested, just go into that area, find if you can do something in there. But um, I, what I can say is it's quite challenging there. Um, so uh, the resistance force, as I mentioned before, we consider rolling resistance, we consider curving resistance, like when you have uh, road vehicle cornering, you will also have extra resistance in the system. Uh, for the track, we will have gradient force um, anyway. So for those forces, we just simulate them, use empirical formula. Um, automatic train driving. Um, so this is a little bit different from autonomous train driving, um, but this comes for, for autonomous, uh, sorry, for autonomous uh, vehicles, you will have perception, decision, and actuation, um, e execution. Um, um, in this automa automatic uh, train driving, we don't have perception step, which means all the, um, in the simulation, all the uh, information are already collected, um, uh, uh, are readily to use. So from that, we, in the automatic train driving um, model, we have decision-making and um, uh, as, because we are not using this for the, um, for the, for the, for the actual hardware, so which means the exec execution part are mostly simplified as well. Um, so why we are using automatic train driving in simulations? One of the motivation come from, okay, for the train driving, one route could have 800 kilometers or like a, how are you gonna come up the train driving commands for that simulation? Um, you could sit there, drive the train like you are playing a game but for, six or eight hours, but that's, that person must be very enthusiastic and uh, doing that uh, 
a heavy job every time. So in this case, you have to have an um, automatic train driving algorithm to generate that the simulation control. So that is one of the reasons why we have these models here. So one of the example here is um, uh, we use the, uh, the train location, the train speed, the train acceleration as input. Then we have some sort of expert system and some other models use fatal logic, neural networks, um, or you have the more advanced controller like an um, LQR controller or some simpler like PID controller. You can all generate this new driving control. Um, but in this model, we just used a very simple uh, experience, experience based um, um, expert system, which means um, at what say, okay, you can expect your 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 speed going to be a um, little bit under the, the speed limit, then um, you want to increase the notch, notch, then if you in if you expect your 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 speed gonna be over speed, you decrease the slodge, uh, the, the the lodge. Um, so the key is you have to expect uh, the predict the future. So you that's why we have to use the current speed and the current acceleration and uh, and the current track gradients. Then using those information we will predict future and then constantly adjust what, how we are driving the train that uh, is the automatic train driving um, model now um, the previous parts have uh, basically covered all the parts we need most of the parts or almost most all, all, all the parts we need for one dimensional train simulation. Now we move to the uh, uh, two-dimensional train dynamics. Uh, in this case, is many um, uh, longitudinal and the vertical uh, uh, directions. Um, so um, like um, to expand the longitudinal train dynamics to longitudinal and the vertical or uh, two-dimensional train dynamics, we need to consider uh, several other components. Uh, those would include the vertical wheel rail contact forces um, and the, the sus vertical suspension forces. And uh, so um, like the first picture showing you a suspension, which we often used in uh, freight rally vehicles. Um, so you, we need to model that suspension system. And also we need to model the contact um, norm, uh, vertical force in uh, the, uh, ver um, the, in the well rail contact. So why that, why that is um, needed in some simulations? Say, as we introduced before, um, the longitudinal force is a product of vertical force and uh, the adhesion coefficient between wheel rail contact. So the longitudinal force is actually related to the vertical force. That's why we need to consider the dynamic changing of the vertical force in the wheel rail contact to be better capture the longitudinal movements of the train system. So uh, other things we consider in the system is the track irregularity, like your roads will also have road irregularities. Um, um, so for the uh, longitudinal force in well rail contact simulations, you we will also have nonlinear uh, characteristics like it, the same thing in tire and road. Uh, in tire and road, when you have a different creepage, um, you will have different adhesion coefficient, different longitudinal tire forces. Um, the creepage co uh, concept is how you um, calculate the creepage. The creepage is basically um, 
uh, the difference between the rotational speed and your translation speed, that difference divided by your translation speed. So that is basically a parameter to quantify the differences between your rotational speed and your uh, translation speed. Say, um, if you have a vehicle which is just keep spinning there, you will have rotational speed, but you won't have longitudinal uh, translation speed. So that is a, uh, the concept of creepage. At different creepage, you will have different adhesion coefficients. Um, okay. Now, um, as uh, to simulate the 2D train dynamics and the 3D train dynamics, we often use a technique called parallel computing because uh, when we move to 2D and 3D, um, the train system becomes very big. And to simulate them, you would require model the details for like 200 vehicles. And you would need to simulate all of them. Um, in that case, um, the simulation time and the modeling um, task is very, very high. So in this case, we use a technique called parallel, com parallel computing to, to help improve the computing speed and uh, to help um, decrease the modeling uh, working loads. So what is parallel computing? Parallel computing, just imagine you have um, uh, two road systems, one with single lane, one with multiple lanes. So if you only have one single lane and one computer cores, then you can only uh, handle one vehicle or one um, computing tax at one time. Then if we have a multiple lane roads, we have a, a multiple computer or we have a supercomputer which have 500 or 600, 1000 computer cores. We can do 1000 or even more comp ta computing tasks at the same time. So that is basically the concept of parallel computing. Um, so to do parallel computing, we have um, the different elements to facilitate uh, uh, this sort of uh, computation. First, that task, one computing task must be able to divide it into smaller tasks. So those smaller tasks can be um, sent to uh, individual computer cores to be handled. Like so one example would be, okay, we have four tires in one car, then you have to simulate those four tires. If we have four computer cores, then we can use, we can, okay, computer one, you do modeling of tire one, computer two, you do tire two, computer three, tire three. But first we have to divide those computer tasks, clearly define them. Then uh, in parallel computing, we usually use one computer to core to coordinate all others. Like you have, have, have to have a boss to tell you, okay, Computer core one, you do what? Core two, you do what? So that one, that computer core who tell other computer core to uh, to do what is often we call master computer cores. Other smaller computer cores, the uh, other computer cores who are doing the exact jobs that we call them as slave computer cores. And also we have to make them to communicate with each other. So there are different um, technologies you can enable this computer course to connect, communicate each other like MPI, OpenMP or, or PO6, um, P3. Um, just do some Google search on them if you are interested. Now, with parallel computing and the true to the train dynamics model we described before, um, now we can simulate the 2D train dynamics um, like shown in this picture. We divide the train into uh, individual vehicles. Then we use, say if we have 100 vehicles in that train, we use 101 computer cores to simulate the model. Um, computer cores zero, we call it 
master computer core. Computer core one to 100, we call them slave computer core. Then one will handle vehicle, core one will can handle vehicle one, and then as such, then we will be able to simulate the individual vehicles. Now, after the simulation of each individual vehicles, those slave cores must report to the master core where they are. After getting their position, then the master computer course can calculate the distance between individual vehicles, then decide at what coupler force they have. That is the connection between individual, among individual vehicles. Having decided that the, the master computer code decided, determined how much force those, that those connection systems are, then they will tell the slave computer course, okay, uh, uh, vehicle one, you will have 200 kilonewton force on your coupler. Then two, vehicle two, you will have 300 uh, uh, kilonewton force on your coupler. Then those individual vehicles use this uh, coupler force, then do their own simulation again, then update their uh, location and the velocity. Then they report back to the master computer core. Then using that cycle, we can do the uh, train simulation. Um, okay, so that basically covers um, the components we need um, to do train, 2D train dynamics and uh, um, the, how we can solve this 2D train dynamics model. Um, of course, this 2D train dynamics model also include many components we described in the 1D longitudinal train dynamics model. Now, we move to 3D train dynamics model. In 3D train dynamics model, one of the major components is the 3D wheel road contact modeling. It's like your 3D tire road contact modeling. The, the, the wheel route contact modeling is probably one of the most complicated uh, tasks in the multi-body dynamics simulations. Um, to do so, we need to consider may, many three components. First is your geometric model. Uh, second is your normal force model. Third is tangential force model. Um, I'll, I'll go to them, I'll talk about them you know, one by one. For the first geometric model is like, okay, as shown in the picture of the bottom um, right figure, we will, we will have this wheel and row. They have very, very nonlinear profile. To get the contact force, you have to develop the geometric model to detect where are the contact points. Like those contact points can be distributed at uh, any of the points of this profile. And uh, oftentimes you can have two or three or even more contact points in the profile. So uh, in, in the geometric model, we have to um, describe those profiles, use this um, specific data, use this uh, uh, data array, then move them in the space to find the contact points, then determine um, the contact um, geometry, like the curvature or at that contact point. Um, then using that, we can move to the vertical. We also need to determine, oh, sorry, back to the geometric model. We also need to determine how much penetration we have. Like, okay, just imagine we have um, two, uh, one wheel and one row. They're gonna push against each other. When we do the geometric model, we assume them as rigid So at each, uh, just assume, um, um, in this case, you have to assume, you, you, we can assume them as rigid, then you can assume them, um, those two bodies penetrating each other. Then 
in the geometric model, you also have to determine how much is the penetration. Um, that penetration then will be later used in the normal force model to determine how much is the normal force. In a normal force, we is also a very complicated problem, like as shown in this bottom uh, left figure. Because of the linearity of the profile, um, the contact patch is very linear shape, like in showing in this figure. Basically, we most commonly we use a theory called Herzian theory, developed by Herz, which is a very famous phys phys um, uh, physics physicist. So he developed um, so that Herzian theory, which can determine at what geom what profile than the geometry of your contact patch. The same thing for your road tire boat um, contact. You will also have a deep, a very nonlinear shape of contact patch. Then in that contact patch, we have different distribution of penetration. Then for that penetration, for that each in the, like showing in the top right figure. We divide that contact patch into those small small grids. Then in each small grid, then you will have different penetration. So that shape was de determined by the Herzing theory. The penetration was developed by the penetration which found the geometric model. Then use very basic nonlinear spring model, which is um, a stiffness multiplied by your penetration, you will be able to determine the normal force in that contact patch. Okay, that is basically the geometric model and the normal force model. Okay, for the normal force model, then we also have non uh, tangential force model. While well, the tangential force model is what we showed here, the very far right figure is the tangential force model, which is you have um, the crippage, which determine gives you a adhesion coefficient. That adhesion uh, coefficient multiplied by your normal force, which is your tangential force. So for the tangential uh, model, we have different theories, like uh, uh, the famous one, we have fast sim. We have modified fast, improved version of fast sim. We have fast stripe. There are different models. Maybe they have very strange names for you, but um, if you're interested, you can Google them. Or we have Polak model, which can do uh, the thing, which can give you the figure, give you the curve. Then with the normal force, uh, you can determine the, 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 uh, the, um, the tangential force. Okay, also for uh, three-dimensional string dynamics, you need to uh, model the, uh, the bulky frame, the car body in three-dimensional space. It's not like two-dimensional space anymore, but for those, you, it's basically just a, a rotational matrix you can, you can, uh, uh, that part is uh, uh, relatively uh, simple compared to the well round contact. <laughs> um, also like on curve, um, we will have um, two adjacent vehicles which have angles. Then when say, for example, in brake, during braking, those two vehicles will push each other. And with that angle, there will be a lateral force generated in the coupler system. So in this slide, I showed you two methods to determine the coupler angle and how much is the lateral components of the force. Um, the first uh, method, uh, which shown in the um, uh, left figure is a, a, a Quasi-static model, 
which basically um, assumes your vehicles are placed in the center of the track, then you, with the radius of the, the, the track, then you will be able to determine the, the, the angle between the vehicles and the, between the couplers. Then the second method, which basically you have to model the couplers as multi-body, um, rigid multi-body. So the coupler is going to move it move itself. Then with that movement, then you will be able to determine what's the angle between the coupler uh, and and the body. So the difference between them is where, whether or not you consider the movements of the coupler itself. Um, so by, that means the cup the, the angle between the coupler and the body can be different between the second model and the first model. So having got all the components we talked about in previous slides from 1D, 2D to 3D, now we can also use parallel computing to simulate the 3D train dynamics as shown in this slide. So we basically, the same thing, we basically divide those train, the vehicles into in individual vehicles, then give each computer call one vehicle to compute, then they will report their velocity and position to the master core. Then the master core will uh, de determine the coupler force for each individual vehicle. Then they will tell the slave cores how much is your um, coupler force. Then they will do uh, the update on their um, position and velocity. So during that cycle, we do three-dimensional train dynamics, just quite similar to 2D. It's just uh, we extended the model itself to three-dimensional. Now we extend what we have discussed to uh, track dynamics. So uh, previously, we mainly talked about railroad contact uh, suspensions and uh, the, the, the above rail system. Now, if we go to below rail, we will have sleepers, ballasts, uh, subgrades. So there are different methods to simulate them, like shown in the um, uh, left figure is um, uh, a finite element model um, where you model the, the, the subgrade, the grade, uh, the, the sub ballast, the ballast, sleepers, and everything as finite element. Then you um, update the position of the rail each time, then pass the position of the rail to the model we described before, then they can change the wheel rail contact forces. Also the same, the changed wheel rail contact forces can be passed to the finite element, can be passed to the track model, then the track model will change the rail position. So that interaction can be captured using those two models, track model and the vehicle models. Okay. The, Top right figures, two figures showing you another method um, to simulate um, the track system, um, which we model, uh, simplify the ballast and the sub ballots as uh, blocks. They are connected by uh, springs and dampers. They are different from the finite element, element, which is continuous. But in this case, we simplify the ballast as uh, blocks. And uh, for the rail, we still model them as finite element. It's just the follow ballast and sub ballast, we model them as discrete, as, um, as, as equivalent blocks. Okay, the model showing at the bottom right figure is probably the most detailed and most sophisticated track model to today, is where you use finite element model to simulate subgrades, which is the soil. Then you use another method called discrete element method to simulate the ballast. Pay attention, there's uh, two different methods. One is finite element methods, 
why is this create element method? This create element, which simulates models as, as separate um, bodies, like uh, in ballast, you have different ballasts. They are actually not connect, physically connected to each other. That's why the researchers use discrete element. Now, for fire elements like your soil, you can um, think them are connected to each other, each other with each other. They are a continuous body. So that's why they use finite element model. But using those finite element model and discrete element model, because they have too much details, the computing speed is very, very slow. And uh, they haven't been used for twin dynamics yet. So the top right figure model, which it has finite element for RAL, but for a uh, block model for the ballast, they are a compromise between um, uh, between the model which don't consider um, flexible track and the finite element model and the ballast model uh, and the discrete element. They are compromised. So they have been used for train dynamics simulations. Um, like in this case, we um, did um, simulations using a flexible um, track model and a multi-body um, vehicle model. We use a co-simulation to combine those two. Um, like I mentioned before, the rail for the the the, the wheel uh, force will be used in the track model to move the rail, then the rail position will be passed to the uh, vehicle model, then change that force in the vehicle model. So as 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 you your autom automotive driving on a road, um, the automotive will change the road. The road will also change the dynamics of the vehicle. That is an interacting process. That's why we are doing code simulations here. So for 3D train track dynamics, uh, we have to consider all the components we described before. And we also have to use um, um, parallel computing. This is more sophisticated than what we described before. But the idea is still using individual computer cores, one computer core for one vehicle. And we have to divide the land track into short pieces. If any, if any of you have done uh, finite element modeling, you will know there is a concept in finite element modeling called boundary condition. So if we divide the land track into small piece, then connect them in boundary condition, then we can send those individual track section to the individual computer course using parallel computing to solve this uh, large train track uh, modeling system as shown in this figure. Um, it's uh, quite complicated. I will not go to the details, but if you're interested, just search the publications. It has more details. I think that basically covered um, all what I want to say from one dimensional to two dimensional to three dimensional train dynamics. And at the end, I want to say, um, send my apologies to any of you who found this uh, present presentation too confusing. Um, it, as I mentioned, it is a, uh, um, a huge topic. It has very a lot of information and um, um, I usually present those to uh, researchers and academics in the same field. Um, I don't know how many of you are research students, how many of you are um, undergraduate students. You mm -hmm. may or may not find it confusing, but um, uh, if, you are, if you found any of this uh, topic uh, is interested, interesting, just um, search uh, the references and uh, or talk with us. Um, yeah, um, 
um, I would be uh, very happy to to um, uh, discuss those topics with you. And um, thanks for your attention and uh, uh, any comments, uh, questions, and discussions. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu. Oh, so, sorry, their feedback. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu, for your excellent presentation. Of course, the presentation is very huge and contain general information on the research on dynamic of trends. So if you if you are in, if any of you interested to go to the detail of this topic, you have to be in contact directly directly with Dr. Wu. So Dr. Wu, in the list of the question, we have about three questions here. So from Ibu Dia. So the first question yeah. for the discrete element modeling of the ballast, like presented in slide 13, how we can make an experimental validation to evaluate if the numerical model of the ballast is good enough? Yeah. So. Um, there are um, methods to validate the model, like uh, here in our research center, what yeah. we have is a huge uh, steel box, uh, which um, are probably uh, three meters by three meters by three meters. That will be uh, 27, uh, oh, sorry, uh, it's probably two meters high, uh, a, a huge steel boxes, a huge steel box. Then we put the ballast in the box. Then that sort of simulate the ballast, then put a sleeper okay. on the ballast, then use a hydraulic pressure to vibrate that uh, ballast, that sleeper. Then you can get the movement of the ballast um, uh, and the, or any breakage of the ballast. Um, I think uh, here in Australia, University of Wollongong, they've done excellent research in that area. Um, um, we just have that boxes, box and they have uh, much better um, facilities in that area. And um, also you can have sensors to be mounted um, vibration center, um, there is a product called uh, Sorry, is it my problem or? Mbak Tias, ini punya saya atau punya dokter? Uh, sepertinya punyanya dokter King Wu ya. Oke. Okay. Sorry, Dr. Wu, we, we cannot hear anything. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I was, yes, uh, I was yes. dropped out. Let's disconnect. Okay. Uh, yeah. where, where was I? Like, um, where was I? Like, like, uh, uh, a test on the ballast and the dy dynamic, maybe the dyna yeah. dynamic test on the ballast and the sensor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is a, a product called Smart Rock, um, yeah. which is a sensor enclosed uh, um, uh, as the shape of the ballast. Then it will it can be placed in the in the track. Then that will. Uh, record your vibration in the system. Um, so uh, using that, you can uh, validate your model as well. And um, also there are other methods um, uh, where they use a corn. Um, you just like what they do uh, test on concrete. Yeah. When they finish the concrete, they lift the concrete, then you will, you will say the shape of that uh, concrete uh, then that can also validate your model. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu. And there is another question from, yes. So thank you, Dr. Wu, for the excellent presentation. Just one, question, just one question. In the current design code of the railway, is it mandatory to perform the dynamic analysis on the train? 
is it mandatory to perform during the design of railway? Yeah, um, um, it it is. Um, uh, how to say? Um, it's not mandatory, but uh, you have to you have to um, um, satisfy the standards. Okay. Comply with the standards. That is your minimum requirements. But um, from what I know, um, almost all new design, new railway systems, new vehicle designs, they have done some simulations. No. It doesn't matter. It's your track topology or your uh, new well rail design or your um, uh, suspensions or your like your coppers, they all have to do some sort of testing. Um, for the track, um, for the track um, design itself is still many um, following the standards, um, but uh, um, more and more researchers and uh, uh, industry, especially in um, in metro trains, um, where the passenger comfort is um, uh, very much yeah. focused, uh, oftentimes they do simulations on the, uh, your track stiffness, your sub ballast, uh, your ballast, your uh, subgrade stiffness, and your uh, uh, your fastening, uh, your rubber pads, do do simulations on that just to avoid any. Uh, resonances um, um, in in your uh, in your track vehicle systems. Um, yeah, simulation is also a good way to compensate where the tests are too expensive or yeah. tests are not in, are, are not possible. Um, all the uh, new system when they uh, trying to uh, comply with the standards, they have to do some testing like draft gears. Um, they have to do impact testing, drop hammer testing. Um, they have to do those sort of testing, fatigue testing. Um, um, some of the testing, like um, the who vehicle testing, um, before the design, um, who vehicle system testing, before, before the manufacture, it's not possible. Um, so in those cases, um, we often do simulations. Yeah. Uh, all in all, um, simulations uh, are quite very important and they're being used more and more uh, in those days, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Dr. Wu. And we have the last question. So in most conditions, particularly when designing the railway bridge, are we allowed to assume the brake force of the train based only on the percentage of the train weight? So maybe in the civil engineering, yeah. We, we assume the, the brake force from the weight of the truck, but for the train, are we allowed to do such way to assume the brake, brake force? Uh, um, brake force, if, if when, when we are designing the truck, uh, mm -hmm. um, so the brake, usually you consider the worst scenario, yes. uh, which is, um, uh, it's not just the weight of the, the, the train. Yeah. You need to uh, multiply that by a, a coefficient of friction um, or adhesion, which uh, probably can go up to 0.5 something. Um, it is okay to, to um, use those sort of uh, um, measure to do your worst scenario uh, studies. Um, like to design your longitudinal um, resistance um, or to design your fastening uh, tow force, um, yeah, to design the, 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 uh, the, the coefficient of friction in the fastening system. Yeah, this can be used, um, but a, I would say a better way would be consider some dynamics in the vertical uh, direction because um, your um, your your uh, your friction your resistance between sleepers and the ballast they can be changed by the vertical force and your um, uh, 
your um, yeah, um, oftentimes it's also a, a a dynamic process. Like your vibration can sort of uh, change the 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 friction in the fastening system as well. Um, but for when we come to uh, train design um, and um, the braking distance design, uh, we have to be more uh, sophisticated and we have to be, have more details. Um, like you need to consider the translation of the uh, cylind brake cylinder force and consider um, your uh, coefficient of friction change in the brake show um, uh, due to uh, train speed changes, due to um, uh, the, the temperature change sometimes for long steep grades. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, for, for, for track design, yeah, you can use simpler worst scenario case. Uh, but uh, another thing is you, um, yeah, probably also need to consider a little bit of the, the grade, um, how much force that's going to change to the longitudinal uh, track force. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ru. And that's all the question that we have. So as Dr. Wu said, if any of you interested in detail on this topic, you can directly contact him by email. So I think this is the end of the session. I give back the session to Ibu Tias as the master of ceremony. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you, Bapak Ahmad Basofi. And thank you very much, Dr. King Wu, for the excellent lecture today. As we have listened, we have had lecture about train dynamics, as well as parallel computing, 3D train dynamics, track modeling, and so on. It's certainly very interesting. And thank you, Papa Ahmad Basofi, for conducting this amazing session. Please give applause to our speaker and moderator, by using the Zoom reaction feature. Thank you. Okay. And furthermore, we would like to present a certificate awarding to our speaker and also our moderator today. This is the certificate for Dr. King Wu. Thanks for that. Thank you very much. Very appreciate it. Okay. And uh, this is the certificate for Bapa Ahmad Basofi, PhD. Uh, thank you, but yes. And once again, we would like to say thank you very much, Dr. King Wu and Bapa Ahmad Basofi for your availability on today's gas lecture series. We believe that your lecture will be beneficial for all participants. And now, before we end our lecture series today, we will invite all participants, as well as honorable speakers and moderator, to take a group photo. To all participants, we would like to ask you to open the camera. Okay. So, okay, please keep smiling until we finish the photo session. Right, I will count one, two, three. Okay, once again, one, two, three. Okay, great. Now we finished the group photo. And then for the participants, please fill the feedback from through the link bit.ly slash feedback um, underscore GLS. But you can also click on the link Zoom or the Zoom chat room. On, and the deadline for filling the feedback form is one hour after we finish the session.
We would like to remind you also the participant who will get the stamp or those who come on time, join this event until the end and also fill the feedback form. And for the next week, we will conduct four interesting topics into different streams. Both streams will represent 11 sustainable development goals, which is sustainable cities and communities. As listed in the poster, the stream A will discuss about modeling small scale process for sustainability, delivered by Associate Professor S. Sharifah Radia Sharif from University of Technology Mara, and then a technopreneurial future, world of innovation, services, and businesses, delivered by Mr. Raven Tabiongan from Summer State University. And finally, we have reached the end of today's guest lecture series. Thank you very much to our honorable speaker, Dr. King Wu, and our moderator, Bapak Ahmad Basofi, PhD, and all participants for the attention and cooperation. We are looking forward to see you again in the next agenda. And don't forget to follow our social media on Instagram at ITS International Office and Facebook ITS International Office and keep updated of our programs. And good afternoon and have a great evening for all of you. GLS on SDGs will be back next, next week. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Allow me to end the session in three, two,